Our speaker tonight is Dr. Richard Summers. Dr. Summers is a native of Hammond, Indiana, and attained his bachelor's degree in history from the Carleton College in Northfield, Minnesota. He earned his doctorate in history at Rice University in Texas in 1970. The U.S. Army hired him as the chief archivist and military historian of the U.S. Army Military History Institute right here at Carlisle Barracks, making him the last charter member of the organization to be hired. He held the position until 1997 and served in various positions in the archives and patron services at the USAHEC until his retirement in 2014. Dr. Summers was the U.S. Army War College Harold K. Johnson Professor of Military History in 2007 and 2008 and continues to teach American history courses at the U.S. Army War College. He has made numerous television appearances, addressed Civil War audiences across the nation, and has presented at the Perspectives of Military History series three times prior to tonight. Dr. Summers has written over 100 books, articles, entries, and reviews primarily on the Civil War and is a distinguished member of several historical organizations, including the Southern Historical Association, the Society of Civil War Historians, and the Civil War Trust. Ladies and gentlemen, I present Dr. Richard Summers. Thank you, Carl. It's a pleasure to be back home at, at USAHEC and devoting 43 years of my uh, professional career here, I of course can never leave. It's always a part of me and I, I feel a part of it and I'm so happy to be able to share in our Perspectives in Military History presentation tonight. And in this 150th anniversary season of the Siege of Petersburg, I'd like to talk about Richmond redeemed enduring lessons in leadership from the Siege of Petersburg. The siege proved one of the longest operations of the Civil War, some nine and a half months, from June of 1864 to April of 1865. It pitted two of the greatest generals in American history directly against each other, Robert E. Lee and Ulysses S. Grant. And it was waged by two of the finest armies of Americans that have ever been raised, the resilient Federal Army of the Potomac and the hard-hitting Confederate Army of Northern Virginia. Those worthy antagonists, which had grappled for the entire war, were reinforced for the siege by several newer armies that had been created only in 1864. Serving in those armies were senior subordinates who had figured prominently in earlier battles in the Eastern Theater, such as Gettysburg and Antietam, which are so familiar to all of us here tonight. These officers include such prominent Northern commanders as George G. Meade, Winfield Scott Hancock, and David M. Gregg, and such senior Southern soldiers as James Longstreet, Richard S. Ewell, and A.P. Hill. With that prelude, let us briefly summarize the siege before we essay to assess it. Petersburg, Virginia, situated on the right bank of the Appomattox River, 20 miles due south of Richmond, was militarily important in its own right as the 10th largest city of the Confederacy, as the head of navigation on the Appomattox River, as the site of the Confederate state's lead works, which manufactured bullets for Lee's legions. However, the strategic significance of Petersburg lay in logistics. How fitting it is, then, that the U.S. Army's logistics center is now situated at Fort Lee, just east of Petersburg, and that our new USAHEC director, Colonel Harney, came to us from the Logistics Center at Fort Lee. Throughout the Civil War, Petersburg functioned as the rail center for Richmond. From northeast, southeast, south and west, railroads ran to the Cockade City, 
as Petersburg was nicknamed. From there, a single railroad continued north to the Confederate capital. Foodstuffs from fertile South Side Virginia, armaments from the ports along the lower Atlantic coast, salt and lead from southwestern Virginia, and most vitally, reinforcements, all funneled through Petersburg to Richmond. Only one other railroad running southwest through Danville and the Carolina Piedmont connected the capital with the rest of the Confederacy. Defending Petersburg and its supply lines was crucial to defending Richmond itself. Capturing the cockade city would comparably cripple the capital. In the first three years of the Civil War, danger remained distant as Lee's masterful generalship kept the Unionists far from Richmond and its rail center. Ulysses S. Grant changed all that. By the spring of 1864, Grant served as general in chief of the entire United States Army. As Eastern Theater commander, and is commander of what I like to call Army Group Grant, an admittedly anachronistic term which I shall nonetheless use because it so accurately conveys the reality that he commanded a group of armies. In all these capacities, Grant carried the war from central Virginia to the vicinity of Richmond. In 30 days of almost incessant fighting, from the Battle of the Wilderness on May 5th and 6th to the Battle of Cold Harbor on June 1st to 3rd, the Illinoisan compelled the Confederates to concede their forward position and confronted them with the constriction of the close and confined coverage of their capital. Then, in a daring southward strike in mid-June, Grant crossed the Chickahominy River crossed the mighty James River itself and attacked the capital's crucial communications center, Petersburg. His leading corps overran the outer defenses, but did not capture the cockade city itself. Federal failure to recognize opportunity, plus heroic defense by the Butternuts, first under PGT Beauregard and later under General Lee himself, saved the city. A grand assault by the Unionists on June 18th was bloodily repulsed. Even worse disaster befell the Yankees uh, less than a week later in their efforts to cut Confederate communications south of the cockade city. Those dual defeats on June 18th and June 22nd, 23rd ended the mobile warfare of spring that had carried the armies from the Rapidan River to the Appomattox. Thereafter, operations stagnated into the slowness of summer, and the siege of Petersburg began. This siege was not tactical. It lacked the saps and parallels and breaching batteries that had typified European siege warfare since the era of Marshal Vauban. Even the several mines at Petersburg, including the infamous Battle of the Crater on July 30th, were aberrations utterly uncharacteristic of the siege. Yet Petersburg unquestionably was a siege on the higher planes of operations, strategy, and grand strategy. In essence, Grant used the siege to fix the gray coats in place at Petersburg and Richmond, and thus to deny Lee the operational and strategic initiative which the Virginian had used to such advantage in 1862 and 1863. Grant's great entrenched camp close up against Petersburg from the east, where Fort Lee now is, with its incessant shelling and sharpshooting of secessionist lines, created an ongoing threat 
which the Southerners could not ignore. More dangerous were the attacks, some of them two-pronged, some of them first strike, which Grant launched from the security of that camp against undermanned positions north of James River and against vulnerable supply lines south of Petersburg. Nine such attacks, which I have termed offensives, punctuated the nine and a half months of the siege. Most were marked by mobile field battles in the open rather than by assaults on well-defended positions. The most significant strikes were the fourth offensive in mid-August, which cut the vital Weldon Railroad linking Petersburg to the blockade runners' ports on the lower Atlantic coast. The fifth offensive in late September, the subject of my book, Richmond Redeemed, which nearly compelled Lee to abandon Petersburg and which threw Richmond into the greatest danger of capture by a field army that the city ever faced until she was occupied without resistance in April of 1865. Then another major one was the Eighth Offensive in early February, which extended the Federal left flank to Hatcher's Run, and the Ninth Offensive in late March, which finally netted both Petersburg and Richmond. Overnight, April 2nd, 3rd, 1865, Lee abandoned Petersburg abandoned his James River defenses, abandoned his capital itself for a last desperate flight toward North Carolina. But North Carolina proved too far away. The federal forces were too advantageously positioned. The butternut brigades had been too badly battered in the course of the siege. One week to the day, after the final fighting at Petersburg came Appomattox. By the spring of 1865, indeed ever since late 1864, the siege had assumed strategic dimensions. Grant made this clear in his letter of December 18th to his trusted subordinate and friend William T. Sherman who had just completed his devastating march to the sea. My own opinion, wrote the general in chief, and now we're quoting General Grant, my own opinion is that Lee is averse to going out of Virginia. And if the cause of the South is lost, he wants Richmond to be the last place surrendered. If Lee has such views, it may be well to indulge him until we get everything else in our hands. The siege thus became a strategic tool for fixing the Southerners in place in the Old Dominion, while Sherman, Philip H. Sheridan, and George H. Thomas devoured the rest of the Confederacy. By March of 1865, Sherman had shoved the Western Theater all the way from Tennessee deep into North Carolina, while in the Eastern Theater, Lee remained pinned at Petersburg. That is the essence of a strategic siege. There now, the nine and a half months of the siege have been summarized in just nine and a half minutes. <laughs> but I'm not done. The various mobile field battles which marched each offensive are fascinating. Many in our AHEC audience and viewing on C-SPAN have heard me speak on one or another of those battles. Here tonight, however, in the Army War College community, the focus should not be tactical but operational and strategic. So let me then suggest some enduring lessons in strategic leadership derived from the siege of Petersburg. An operation lasting nine and a half months proclaims perseverance, both its prizes and its pitfalls. <laughs> 
Grant's bulldog tenacity in grabbing hold of the Army of Northern Virginia in the wilderness of Spotsylvania and never letting go all the way through Petersburg to Appomattox is one of the greatest hallmarks of his generalship. Yet just what did this tenacity, this perseverance, entail at Petersburg? Part of it, as we've seen, involved fixing the Southerners in place, tactically, operationally, and strategically. Yet such fixing in place did not come easily. Time and again, in the mobile field battles south of Petersburg and north of James River, Grant was defeated tactically. Even so, he managed to weave such setbacks into operational and strategic success. He achieved su such success despite those battlefield setbacks because he remained undaunted. His calm, quiet confidence in himself gave him the determination to keep up the struggle. Then too, his assurance in his own mind of ultimate federal victory in the siege and in the war gave him the ability to press ahead despite temporary setbacks. Together, such self-confidence and such certainty of success produced military peace of mind, which freed him from doubt, fear, anxiety, and torment that had vexed so many other army commanders, and which thus enabled him to focus on succeeding in the siege and on winning the war. Yet within such military peace of mind, Grant was neither arrogant nor bullheaded. An even greater hallmark of his strategic leadership than tenacity was his ability to learn and apply the lessons of experience. Such a faculty had won him victory at Vicksburg. It also produced the prize of Petersburg. When he perceived that frontal attacks, which had worked so well in the Western theater, brought only heavy casualties in the East, culminating in the disastrous repulse of June 18th in the First Battle of Petersburg, Grant explicitly forbade such assaults against well-defended, fortified positions. He launched no further such attacks throughout the siege until the final onslaught of April 2nd. Again, when experience demonstrated that sequential two-pronged strikes on both sides of James River were not working, he progressively altered the timing of those strikes until by late October, they became simultaneous. And when simultaneous strikes, too, failed, he again adjusted his grand tactics to massive first strikes by his left south of the Cockade City. Such first strikes carried him to Hatcher's Run in February and carried him into Petersburg and Richmond in April. Yet Grant was not the only senior leader to display perseverance at Petersburg. His Confederate counterpart also showed tenacity in holding that city and Richmond. Lee understood their practical and symbolic importance to the Southern war effort and to the Southern cause, and he fought to save those cities. Fought is the key concept here. Lee did not sit supinely in his trenches awaiting blue coat attack. When they left their defenses of the entrenched camp to attack him, he left his defenses to attack them. Although he never again controlled the strategic initiative, 
which remained in Grant's hands throughout the siege, the great Confederate commander repeatedly challenged the Yankees for control of the operational and tactical initiatives. The ensuing battles were not static, set-piece struggles of attack and defense, but fluid, mobile field battles that raged up and down the ground, in which the secessionists' superior knowledge of terrain often enabled them to offset their numerical weakness with surprise flank attacks that halted the Union advance. Counterattacking attackers offers obvious advantages. Even more significantly, those counterattacks reflect Lee's approach to warfare. He did not equate probable disadvantage with certain loss, but rather strove to redirect the military situation to his advantage. By way of contrast, Joe Johnston in Georgia when threatened, would fall back. And when threatened again, he would fall back. And when threatened ag yet again, he would still fall back. Lee, when threatened, did not fall back. Lee fought back. And in the fifth offensive, covered in Richmond redeemed, Lee was prepared to abandon Petersburg on September 30th, if necessary, to save Richmond. Yet he did not yield to such likely danger, but battled back and saved both cities. Through such fighting tenacity, Lee prolonged the security of his supply lines, his army, his capital, and his country for another nine months. Yet the end eventually came, and all was lost. This outcome was due, at least in part, because the Greycoats held on to Petersburg too long. I do not blame Lee for this decision or this outcome. He did not become general in chief of all Confederate armies until February of 1865, too late to affect the course of the war. The decision to remain in Richmond rested with the government. As a professional soldier of the Confederate Republic, Lee loyally carried out government policy. There is an aspect of perseverance, however, where Lee at Petersburg may be criticized. Unlike Grant, who learned from experience, the Virginian continued fighting in ways that had worked well earlier in the war, but that were no longer applicable in mid-1864. Unlike at Gaines Mill, 2nd Manassas, or Chancellorsville, his counterattacks at Petersburg almost never drove the Union strike force from the field. At best, they simply stopped that force short of its objective. Follow-up counterattacks, understandable though they were, invariably failed to overcome the Federals. Instead, they simply produced mounting Confederate casualties with no corresponding conquests. For Lee at Petersburg, the old ways no longer worked. Such hallmarks of generalship characterized the exercise of command by Lee and Grant at Petersburg. Yet with armies ranging from approximately 50,000 to 60,000 secessionists and from 100,000 to 127,000 bluecoats, those two commanders obviously could not control everything themselves, but had to rely on senior subordinates. Here, too, lay lessons in leadership. To begin with, both commanding generals worked with and through their senior subordinates, not around or despite them. They accorded those responsible subordinates latitude to exercise the responsibilities of their offices. As theater commander and army group commander, the Illinoisan focused on strategy and left operations and tactics to his army commanders and corps commanders. Army of the Potomac commander, Meade, earned and retained Grant's respect. 
although the two generals never became close personally. The other Yankee Army commander, Benjamin F. Butler of the Army of the James, was the quintessential political general of the Union Army. Despite Butler's many shortcomings as a field commander, Grant recognized both the Massachusetts man's talents and also understood the necessity of working with such an influential politician. Not until Butler finally discredited himself with the powder boat fiasco in December of 1864 did the general in chief at last have grounds for removing the insubordinate subordinate. Butler's successor was the able professional soldier Edward Ord, for whom Fort Ord would later be named, who had earned Grant's respect and friendship in the Western theater. Because the Illinoisan liked Ord, he tolerated the junior officer's quaint conceits. Such antics by other senior subordinates usually cost them Grant's respect and therefore their commands. William F. Smith, William T.H. Brooks, and Quincy Adams Gilmore were all relieved of their core commands when they demanded actions or promotions that Grant was unwilling to grant them. John Gibbon almost suffered the same fate, and much more tragically, by the final hours of the siege, Warren had so drained the reservoir of goodwill that he had earned on Little Round Top that neither Meade nor Grant would save him from the implacable wrath of Phil Sheridan. Sheridan's practice of summarily relieving generals on the field of battle was atypical of the Siege of Petersburg and of command style in the Civil War. More characteristic was Grant's practice of avoiding wholesale house cleanings of uh, subordinates and instead working with and through them until they either succeeded or else discredited themselves with their ineptitude or their overweening ambition. Lee's command style was similar. Earlier in the war, to be sure, he had cleansed the Army of Northern Virginia of senior subordinates who had not measured up. By the time Petersburg was besieged, however, the terrible attrition of general officers reduced him to working with and through those who remained. By then, the great Stonewall Jackson and Jeb Stuart were dead and James Longstreet had been severely wounded at the wilderness. The best of Lee's subordinates at Petersburg was Beauregard, but he departed on September 23rd and soon thereafter was put in command of the Western Theater. A month later, the able Longstreet returned to duty. Among the newcomers to Corps Command, Wade Hampton and John B. Gordon proved promising but Richard H. Anderson was disappointing. Then too, Richard S. Ewell and A.P. Hill had never lived up to expectations. Indeed, just before the armies besieged Petersburg, Ewell was politely eased out of field command and put in charge of the Department of Richmond. By then, however, the capital was no backwater. The Richmond sector formed a prominent portion of the Petersburg siege lines. There, Ewell rendered his most crucial contribution to the Confederate cause by saving the capital from federal attack on September 29th in the operations covered in Richmond Redeemed. Yet whether subordinates are able or not, they are the tools which, with which senior leaders must work. The chain of command, moreover, runs upward as well as downward. One of the greatest strengths of both Grant and Lee is that they understood the proper relationship between the uniformed general-in-chief and the constitutional commander-in-chief in a republic at war. They not only worked for, but also with, President Lincoln and President Davis 
and certainly not against them. Those great generals earned and retained the respect of their chief executives and thus were accorded the latitude to apply their professional abilities in service to their embattled nations. Contrast their success with what became of Beauregard, Joe Johnston, William S. Rosecrans, George B. McClellan, and many other army commanders who constantly quarreled with their respective governments and who thus were kept on close reign, marginalized, or shunted aside altogether. This ability to work with the president comes through clearly in the following correspondence between Grant and Lincoln in mid-July of 1864. In my opinion, wrote the Lieutenant General, and here we're quoting Grant now, in my opinion, there ought to be an immediate call for, say, 300,000 men to be put in the field in the shortest possible time, close quote. Grant then specified many benefits from increasing the fighting force. Finally, he summarized, the greater number of men we have, the shorter and less sanguinary will be the war. Yet he did not stop there but went on to make clear that I give this entirely as my views and not in any spirit of dictation, always holding myself in readiness to use material given to me to the best advantage I know how. The following day, the president replied, Yours of yesterday about a call for 300,000 is received. I suppose you have not seen the call for 500,000 made the day before, and which, I suppose, covers the case. Always glad to have your suggestions. <laughs> so close and so effective were the bonds that, that Lincoln not only welcomed Grant's suggestions, but actually engaged in a little harmless humor about them. Not that war was a laughing matter, but that though two men were close enough to share a smile as together they strove for success. That exchange not only underscores their effective working relations, it also provides other lessons in strategic leadership. Grant recognized the benefit of applying overwhelming force, and he realized that the North possessed such power potentially. His great talent lay in understanding how to convert advantages into achievements. Yet all the while, he did not demand perfection. Unlike some senior leaders who insisted on waiting until everything was perfectly arranged and who thus often waited forever, Grant was willing to give it a try with whatever resources were at hand. Those resources often sufficed to produce positive results. The president liked those results and he liked the attitude of the general who was always willing to act. Lee, too, was willing to act, but under much different circumstances. He knew that the South had fewer soldiers and fewer resources, and he realized that time was not on his side. He could not wait for perfection of positions, powers, and plans for they remained unattainable. He instead tried to make his own perfection in outcomes by seizing the strategic and operational initiative or by wresting it from the Yankees. In 1862 and 1863, he often managed to achieve such results. By the time that Petersburg was besieged, however, Grant controlled the strategic an operational initiative, and Lee was reduced to fending off federal offense. 
Yet as we consider Grant and Lee and their senior subordinates, it is important that we not mistake them for the magnificent monuments that grace our national battlefields and our public places today. The statues of Meade and Hancock, Lee and Longstreet at Gettysburg, of Grant looking down the National Mall in Washington, or Wade Hampton in Columbia, South Carolina. Those giant sculptures of bronze and marble honor the generals, but they are not the generals. The generals themselves, we must always keep in mind, were real, live human beings with varying degrees of the qualities, noble and ignoble, which mark the human condition. Courage and heroism and honor and perseverance and vision to be sure, but also rivalry and jealousy and resentment and bitterness and vindictiveness. By the time that the armies reached Petersburg in mid-June of 1864, the soldiers were exhausted physically and psychologically from over six weeks of incessant fighting and marching and fighting yet again. So were their commanders during the hot, dry, seemingly ceaseless siege Anger flared among Meade and his corps and division commanders, and among Confederate division commanders as well. Such strife certainly affected command relations and sometimes also affected operations. Such personal animosity is not confined to Petersburg, to the Civil War, or to olden times. It can flare up today and tomorrow. Senior strategic leaders need to recognize that reality and to be prepared to deal with it. Understanding human dimensions of high command is just one lesson from the siege. Persevering, weaving tactical setbacks into strategic success, adapting flexibility of methods to fixity of purpose, not yielding to possible threats, but fighting back against the odds, displaying strategic vision, converting advantages into achievements, functioning effectively within chains of command, upward, downward, and laterally. All these are enduring lessons in leadership from the Siege of Petersburg when Richmond was redeemed. And I thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to do a few questions and answers now. I'll start over on this side and work our way over. If you do have a question, please raise your hand. Uh, we do have quite a few people in the crowd, though, so please limit yourself to one question at a time. So do we have anybody over here to start, off, start us off? All right, do we have, oh, here we go. Yeah, Richard, uh, just a question about Lee's strategic vision. So you've commented on the fact that he had a strategic vision, but could it also not be the case that by 1864, he knew that the South had lost? There wasn't the opportunity for the offensives in 1862 or 1863 that it was over. So in fact, if he had strategic vision, perhaps as a leader, he should have encouraged his president to sue for peace uh, earlier than uh, April of 1865. Just any thoughts on that? Uh, thank you, Jeff. That's a, an excellent question. I think it is pretty clear that well along into the siege, Lee came to realize that the cause of the South is lost. I don't think he had reached that decision in the spring or summer or even autumn of 1864. Lee was fighting back and fighting very effectively to maintain his position 
and to, to keep up the, the struggle. Uh, there are so many indications that the Confederates themselves did not realize their grand strategic peril, talking about the whole Civil War now, until it was too late. Even when Sherman had completed or had cut loose from Atlanta for his march through Georgia, the Confederates really didn't know where he was going, whether he was heading east towards Charleston, south towards Tallahassee, southwest toward Mobile. As it turned out, he went southeast uh, to Savannah. And it's not surprising that the Confederates didn't know because even the federal planners didn't know. And their logisticians had supplies positioned all along the coast that wherever Sherman struck uh, blue water, he could be, he could be resupplied. But once Sherman made his march and captured Savannah on December 21st, the Confederates were still not sure what he was going to do next. And they positioned their forces all around him to include south of Savannah to guard against the danger that he might uh, march against uh, Thomasville, the railhead in southern Georgia, or to, to liberate Andersonville, or perhaps to threaten Tallahassee. It really wasn't until he moved north through the Carolinas that it, it became clear to the, the Confederate um, in uh, Richmond how dire was, was their peril. But I don't think that Lee or anyone else foresaw that danger as early as any point in 1864, and that he is continuing to do his duty to uh, bravely and honorably uphold the struggle. Other questions or comments? Thank you, Dr. Summers, very much for a fine presentation. I have a question about leadership, which you just touched upon. Late in the Civil War, and I don't know exactly when, at some time, Ulysses Grant was given the authority to promote general officers in the field, subject to confirmation by the United States Senate. I assume that that authority came to him through Lincoln and Stanton and probably the Senate. I know that you probably do know, but it was by that route that Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain achieved the rank of Brigadier General. My question to you is, were there any other officers so promoted by Grant in the field? And do you know throughout the course of American history if any commanding general was ever given such authority besides Grant? Well, General Lee, in effect, had, had that authority in, in the Army of Northern, of Northern Virginia. Uh, the appointment power rests with the president. The, the Senate's role is to confirm presidential uh, appointments, and that is both the appointment by grade to be a brigadier general or a, a major general, and also um, corps command and army and department command were considered uh, presidential appointments. Uh, Grant promoted uh, several officers during the course of the Siege of Petersburg, certainly not uh, Chamberlain alone, but the, um, it's always consistent with the basic government uh, practice of uh, heeding recommendations of uh, officers in the field as to whom they want as their senior subordinates, but not every officer that Grant wanted was uh, provided to him. It's very interesting that at the time that Jubal Early uh, erupted in the Shenandoah Valley in July, uh, actually carried the war to the outskirts of Washington, D.C., and then remained a continuing threat in the lower Shenandoah Valley, uh, even burning Chambersburg, Pennsylvania on July 30th, the officer whom Grant wanted to put in charge to deal with the threat posed by a General Early was none other than William B. Franklin. Despite 
Franklin's performance at Eltham's Landing, his performance at Crampton's Gap, his performance at Fredericksburg, his performance in the Red River campaign, all of which uh, fell far short of the high expectations that had been accorded to Franklin uh, going into the uh, Civil War. Grant, who had never actually served with Franklin during the war, nonetheless had high confidence in his ability. But there had been a time when they had been together, and that was at the US Military Academy when Franklin was the number one graduate in Grant's class. And I have to think that Cadet Sam Grant is still looking up to the number one man in his class. But however that may be, uh, Washington denied him that promotion and said that Franklin just will not do uh, for this position. So uh, his next choice was General Meade to give Meade a more independent command that he enjoyed as, in effect, uh, an executive officer within Grant's army group. But then something happened. I'm not entirely sure what. It might have been the Battle of the Crater, which ended the career of General Burnside, but did not uh, present Meade in a very favorable light. Anyway, uh, Meade is no longer in the picture after July, and the command is uh, finally entrusted to Philip H. Sheridan. Sheridan was not the first choice for that command. He was the third choice, uh, and, and that was a case where uh, Grant did not get his first choice. And uh, one of the cases where I think probably the North was well served that uh, Franklin was not, not put in command. Yeah. That, Thank you. To follow up on your discussion there on the animosities and rivalry that took place uh, after, just before the battle or the siege of Petersburg, uh, as I understand it, that happened on both sides. Very much so. Where Beauregard had Lee listened to Beauregard in the beginning rather than doubting him, the outcome would have been entirely different. Suppose the same thing is true on the northern advances initially. 15th, 16th of June before that siege took place. There was just a total lack of cooperation and even follow-up. And some of that is attributed to the horrendous defeat in the Battle of the Crater. We, we mentioned everybody was fatigued, excuse me, at Cold Harbor, which meant that everybody was fatigued and, and what have you. But Beauregard was still trying to overcome some bad press early on. You, you support that? Uh, to a considerable extent, but not so much bad press, but his bad command uh, relations with, uh, with Richmond, with President Davis, with Secretary of War Seddon, with, with the nominal General-in-Chief Braxton Bragg. Um, and there was a, there had always been a certain healthy rivalry between Lee and Beauregard as two very bright engineers on Winfield Scott's staff in the Mexican War, as two uh, superintendents of the military academy, although Beauregard was short-stopped in actually assuming that position by the, the outbreak of the war. Uh, within the Confederacy, where uh, Lee was the third-ranking general and Beauregard was the fifth-ranking general, but, but the real problem here uh, was the, the bad relations, and this underscores another point that I made. No matter how good Beauregard was, and I think he was the second best army commander in the Confederacy after Lee. Stonewall Jackson might have proved to be a great army commander, but he was never given that chance with a real field army. His so-called army of the, the valley was, in effect, an independent corps. But among the, uh, the officers actually entrusted with army command, I would put Beauregard right up close behind Lee. But the big difference is that Beauregard is constantly feuding with Richmond and feuding with Braxton Bragg, and thereby he's nullifying his ability to bring his great talents to the service of the Confederacy, the same way that McClellan and Rosecrans and Buell and other Union generals, by feuding with Washington, uh, 
reduced or nullified their ability to serve the, the United States in the war. Now, as to the, the exhaustion, certainly Cold Harbor is a culmination, but I would suggest it's really the almost incessant fighting that begins on May 5th in the wilderness and continues to June 23rd at the uh, first battle of the Weldon Railroad that just wears out the armies physically and psychologically. And Grant recognizes this, and that's one reason that Petersburg becomes a siege and that he doesn't continue always moving by his left flank in the mobile warfare that had carried the armies all the way from Culpeper County uh, down to Prince George and, and Dinwiddie counties at, at Petersburg. Uh, the term combat fatigue, psychological exhaustion were not known to military medicine in the mid-19th century, but that's not to say that the conditions did not exist, just they weren't recognized. Uh, and, and this is an important part in fraying the tempers and uh, uh, leading to the, the feuding and animosities among commanders. Uh, Joe, when you get a microphone. Uh, a great job on NPR this morning, too. Uh, question on Grant's strategy. After all the hammering on the Overland campaign, and yeah, I understand something about combat stress, that he sat himself down at Petersburg for nine and a half months, that the Army couldn't restore itself within a month or so, and then just go back because Lee was just hanging on by his toenails. Any comment on Grant's change in strategy besides what you had just said earlier. Good questions, Joe. Um, the Army of the Potomac would restore its tone, but it would take much more than a month to do it. It really took the winter of 1864-1865 with the relatively reduced pace of activity. There were two offensives, one in early December and one in early February, but really the armies could rest essentially over that winter and regain their, their fighting tone. Some of the um, officers and soldiers who had been wounded earlier in the war uh, or even earlier in the 1864 campaign, and I regard the entirety of operations from May of 64 to April of 65 as a unitary campaign. Officers who had been wounded earlier in that campaign returned to duty. Also, the new regiments that were being raised under this call for 500,000, about which, which Lincoln and, and uh, Grant had their little laugh in mid-July, this began to uh, produce vast numbers of troops, not 500,000, but large numbers of troops that started arriving at the Petersburg front in mid-September and would continue on through October into early November. And here in Pennsylvania, we think of the, the series of, of troops from the 198th uh, to the 211th that would uh, come down uh, to form part of the Army of the James and the Army of the Potomac, most of the regiments in that, in that numerical sequence. We all know about the raw troops at first Bull Run who fought but could not stand under the pressure of a day's fighting. We, so close to Antietam, so many of us have visited there, know about the, the raw regiments in the Army of the Potomac that had only been in uniform for a few weeks when they were thrown into the maelstrom at South Mountain and Antietam. It was not reserved to July of 1861 or September of 1862 to have this effect on raw troops. It is a universal truth throughout the entire Civil War that raw troops need time to train and sometimes the most healthy and 
tempering training comes by being blooded in battle. In the 6th Offensive, a lot of these new regiments that had just uh, reached the front in early October and were thrown into action in late October broke and ran, just like the troops at Antietam and First Bull Run. Though they needed time. It's not to say that they were cowards or that they were poor material. They just needed time. And by the spring of 1865, they had had the time and the experience to prove to be effective soldiers. There's also the matter of individual uh, replacements. There is a misunderstanding that is often told about the Civil War that uh, Shall I use a modern term, R4Gen, Army Force Generation? Was fundamentally different between the Union and the Confederacy that the South would put individual replacements into existing units, whereas the North would raise entirely new units. And there's certainly some truth in those two statements, but not entirely. The Yankees began putting many individual replacements into existing units starting after Gettysburg in the late summer and early autumn of 1863 and continuing for the rest of the war. And some of these men were called up in response to the national conscription. More were called out in response to the increased bounties that were being offered. And there's nothing wrong with an honest uh, enlistment bonus. There's something terribly wrong with bounty jumping. A much lower caliber of individual was, uh, were brought forward and put into the regiments in response to these various uh, recruitment efforts that would change the tone of those uh, regiments. The, the 35th Massachusetts, a New England Yankee regiment, received a great influx of German recruits fresh off the boat in September of 1864. These were not the 48ers who had a great commitment to liberty in Germany and carried their German uh, liberalism and the sense of liberty over to the United States and lived in our country for a dozen years and identified with the Northern cause or in a few cases with the, the Confederate cause. These were fresh off the boat. They couldn't speak German. Or, or they could speak German, they couldn't speak English, and the officers couldn't speak German. So they, uh, it was very difficult to communicate. And, and the commander of that regiment in one of the, the battles that we cover in Richmond Redeemed, in effect said, uh, we just stood there when the Confederates attacked and really couldn't contribute anything and would have been justified in leaving the field except for the obvious propriety of sharing the casualties with everybody else. Well, that's not the way to win a battle. But that's often the consequence of of this type of uh, individual replacement. Again, we think of the, another great New England fighting regiment, the, the 5th New Hampshire, the regiment of Edward Cross, about which Bruce Catton writes so eloquently at the, at the uh, sunken road, the bloody lane at Antietam, where Colonel, or later when Colonel Cross gives his life in charging across the wheat field at Gettysburg. By 1864, the 5th New Hampshire had to be stuck inside a redoubt with a different regiment guarding the gate to make sure that the regiment did not desert en masse. So much as it had been filled up with these replacements lacking commitment to the war effort in contrast to the uh, original soldiers who had won such imperishable glory on the peninsula and at Antietam and uh, Gettysburg. Though to the extent that those individual replacements have any merit at all, they too need time to learn soldiering. And it, it took a good while to uh, uh, create this uh, condition uh, for them. Now, now for the Confederates, uh, 
they too continued to put individual replacements into uh, their ranks. Very few uh, new Confederate units were being raised late in the war, and there weren't a whole lot of them in, in backwater areas to be brought to the front either. There was actually a large call up of individual replacements that come to the uh, Confederates in October of 1864 in response to a, uh, a bill um, and an order from the War Department that would use slaves and reservists, these reservists being men beyond the normal military age, um, use these to take over conscription and enforcement and impressment duties, uh, working in the, the uh, NIDER and Mining Bureau, on which you've done such good work, Mike Lynch, uh, to free up able-bodied men who were performing these, these important duties in the rear to free them up to join the, uh, the forces at the front. And so if you look at the roles of Lee's army, it is actually stronger at the end of October, despite all of its, its casualties in five big battles, stronger than it is at the end of September because these individuals have joined it. But some men who were perfectly happy to be a soldier guarding Danville prison or enforcing uh, conscription in Charlotte, uh, North Carolina, or impressing uh, crops around uh, Augusta, Georgia, weren't at all happy to be in the trenches of Petersburg and Richmond where the cannonballs were exploding and the sharpshooter bullets were flying. And the first dark night, they might literally head for the hills. The, 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 the hill country of Appalachia uh, became a, a great haven for uh, uh, people who had escaped from, uh, fled from military service, deserters. And until such time as they made their getaway, they uh, spread the cancer of their uh, lack of commitment among the good and faithful soldiers who remained. Uh, just in this subject of desertion, in the late summer and early autumn of 1864, there is almost a dynamic equilibrium of desertion of Confederates deserting to the Union Army and Unionists deserting to the Confederate Army at Petersburg. The, the Confederates would put out uh, flyers in German and Belgian and French and, and Dutch and Gaelic uh, inviting uh, these uh, new individual replacements to come over to the Confederacy. All of that begins to change in mid-November of 1864. On November 8th, President Lincoln is overwhelmingly re-elected. The, the Peace Democrats, the Copperheads, are completely repudiated by the Northern people, and it becomes unmistakably clear that there will be four more years of unrelenting war. And one week to the day after the re-election of Lincoln, General Sherman cuts loose from Atlanta for his march to the sea, which devastates much of the interior of Georgia. And with these two fundamental blows to the psyche of the Confederate war effort, uh, desertion by the, the graycoats greatly increases over defections from the Union lines. So Joe, uh, thank you for that, that question. Uh, it, it, uh, please, uh, please. I won't promise a quick answer, though. <laughs> Good evening, Dick. Good evening, John. Talk about strategic leadership. Can you talk about the, uh, the nature of the civil military relations between the presidents of the Union and the Confederacy with their senior military officers? So between Lee and um, uh, Jefferson Davis and, and uh, Lincoln and Grant. Thank you. Yeah, th th thank you, Chuck. Th this was extremely uh, important, these relations. Uh, by constitutional prescription, we all know it's in the U.S. Constitution. It was the same wording verbatim in the Confederate Constitution. The president 
shall be commander-in-chief of the Army and Navy of the United States and of the militia of the several states when called into the actual service of the United States or of the Confederate States. By constitutional prescription, the President has the right to involve himself in the war effort. But no president, not even George Washington, who certainly had the, the credibility dur during the, the Whiskey Rebellion, wants to assume field command of the army. The presidents want to work through the generals and, and admirals in charge of our armed forces. But it, it's understanding the proper relationship, striking the right balance, some of the great war presidents we've had, like Franklin D. Roosevelt or uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, 41, strike a, very good, strike a very good balance there. Other presidents, like James Knox Polk or Lyndon Baines Johnson, don't strike such a good balance, but they have the right to involve themselves. And good generals understand that and work with their presidents. And both Grant and Lee understood this, and it was one of their greatest strengths and one of the principal reasons why the presidents accorded those generals the latitude to apply their great ability in behalf of their respective nations. Whereas you can go all the way back to, to Winfield Scott and look at uh, Joe Johnston and McClellan and many Civil War generals and carry it right on up uh, through uh, General MacArthur to Admiral Fallon and General McChrystal in, uh, uh, in our own time to see what happens to able professional military men who set themselves against their own government. There's only going to be one outcome to a situation like that, and there should be only one outcome, and the professional military that we have here in the Army War College community, the future strategic leaders of our armed forces understand that, uh, that relationship, and it, it's one of the greatest insights that uh, military history uh, affords to our, our professional military education today, which is one of the reasons why history is one of the enduring themes here at the Army War College. And so that I might not be an enduring theme here all night, <laughs> I'll thank you for this opportunity to have spoken to. Very quick presentation, sir, if you'd like to. Well, Doc Summers, uh, welcome to this. Is, uh, I've heard a lot about your lectures, and uh, uh, didn't it, this this amazed me. So it was it was really good. But uh, I got to tell you, uh, it's it's good to have uh, Tracy and yourself back here today, uh, in, in in this uh, this forum, and you all are family, and I think you all know that. So on behalf of the uh, staff and faculty and students of the uh, of the uh, Army War College, as well as uh, your USAHEC family, I'd like to give you a, a small token of our appreciation for a job well done tonight. <laughs>